Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you so much. We have a great conversation today, but first I want to point out that my guests are so knowledgeable and so giving in sharing that today's guest, Nicole Will, is back again to talk about the topic we had originally planned. I got confused and went off on a caring for the caregiver topic, and she rolled with it so well that I didn't even realize we (laughs) technically recorded the wrong topic until we were all done. So she's back to give us even more advice on the dynamic between families and senior living communities and their employees. So welcome back, Nicole. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, It's always fun to visit with you. And yeah, our last conversation, I remember you opened up the topic and we were going to chat and I was like, and I had to just go with it, which is good. I'm right when you're in, when you're in this and talking about it, (laughs) luckily I could pull out my, my wisdom (laughs) or hopefully, hopefully wisdom and knowledge. So I didn't even realize that we were (laughs) technically on the wrong topic. That's how good you were. You could have said, wait a minute, I thought we were discussing X because, you know, (laughs) editing is always available. Right, right. Oh, thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be back. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So the previous episode, the one that was technically the wrong topic, like I says, caring for the caregiver came out on January 16th. And like I said, today we're talking about the dynamics between family and living, um, senior living communities. But let's start with a case you haven't met Nicole before. Why don't you give us your background? Nicole is also a podcaster and obviously an extremely intelligent. (laughs) Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's just fun to be in this space with you. And I love that we share the podcast and, you know, we both have our, our background and history with caring for the loved one in our life. So for me, it was really bringing uh, my two worlds together and my heart behind that of caregivers, family, uh, senior living, because it's a part of my personal story. So I was 15 years old. My grandma moved in with my family. In fact, we had to move houses to accommodate grandma moving in so that she would have her own space. And when you're 15 years old and you're starting high school, you really don't want to move, right? Or you have to figure out like all, all new things. Luckily, we stayed within the same city. I could attend the same high school and the friendships that I've built. And I know not everyone is that fortunate. So I'm thankful that my parents took that into consideration. And we cared for my grandma. We walked through life with her. And she really, I think, set the stage for how I view my relationships, not only with the caregiving, but with my grandma and family dynamics and older adults. And she was one of my closest friends. Um, At the same time that my grandma was living with us, I was growing older and went to college and studying, you know, various subjects and decided to study gerontology, which is actually the the study of aging and what that looks like. And I began my career um, working more hands-on. I was a nursing assistant in college and then a medication care manager and then worked in a senior living community on their therapeutic rehab unit, which gave me this great clinical background and oversaw um, a few departments as a director as I kind of worked my way up. And um, given my background and my personal life, I had friends and colleagues and family that would ask me questions about older adults or aging, senior living, and I had access to information and resource and I kept up on my CEUs, but I always felt like families really need to be the ones that have the knowledge and and access to this information and people and businesses and resources that can support them. So having that background, I wanted to be able to do that. And I can't remember if we talked about this the first time, but on a personal note, along with my grandma, my dad is also a documentary filmmaker. And so I've traveled with him for, oh my gosh, since we were little in different states and countries and watched him interview scholars and educators and 
uh, really saw the value of asking really good questions, showing up with curiosity, having good conversation. And I felt like now is the time to do that. And what I love is that there are, you know, a good handful of us in this space, actually probably more than a handful now, where we all have our unique style and we can bring out different things in our guests and and support each other in this um, podcast world. And Will Gather is multifaceted in that we have the podcast, but I also sit on advisory board supporting companies and a caregiver gift shop named after my grandma who we cared for uh, called Gigi Betty Co. And it is jewelry where you can gift the caregiver in your life something really special. So um, our podcast is navigating the world with your aging loved one. And a lot like what you do, we, you know, elevate and amplify all of those resources and support for family caregivers. So I'm thankful to be here and share a little bit more of my story with you. I'm pretty sure you didn't mention documentary filmmaker because I would okay. have remembered that. Okay, Since good. <laughs> I'm a retired portrait photographer. That speaks to that speaks oh, to my other half. Absolutely. Okay, I got to hear about this sometime. That's incredible. Yeah. And it's it it also dealt with families. It was oh. fun because you know you're making something beautiful and historic for families and yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. It was, it was kind of interesting to pour. Like when my dad was on hospice, um, mm. I had a family that literally had an appointment like 36 hours after my dad died. And wow. I never said anything until everything was all done. She was picking everything up. And that's wow. when I told her that, because she was just thrilled and I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but mm-hmm. I just, I knew, well, I wasn't going to get any more pictures of my dad. And so I poured mm-hmm. all of those feelings into that family. So wow. that's kind of what I do with my show. It's like, when yeah. I started, for those who haven't been around for the 300 plus episodes, mm-hmm. because I couldn't find the information that worked for me for my mom. Right. And after right. my dad died, we moved mom to memory care, which is kind of what we're going to talk about in a minute. Mm-hmm. And all of the traditional advice, I mean, she and I flunked those things just oh, spectacularly. Man. You know, I would bring old, I had a scrapbook that's pictures of me and my sister now, for anybody that catches a video clip or sees this on YouTube, my sister looks more like Nicole. Than oh, really? <laughs> She's got dark hair, chocolate brown eyes, oh tans at the drop of a hat. I'm out there <laughs> dodging between, you know, dashing between the shadows because I'm um, pale and blonde and don't tan. So. Oh, okay. So we share something else because my sister is blonde hair and blue eyes. <laughs> And we look nothing alike, but I kind of love that because we'll be out together. People have no idea we're related, so it's kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, we had the same yeah. thing. We'd have to tell people. We'd have to if we pointed out that like our jawline and like mm-hmm. mouth and jaw were the, they were basically the same. Like right. dad, sister, and I all had the same jawline. So then people could see, and they're like, oh, yeah, okay, now we can see your sister. Because most of the time, people didn't believe us. I'm like, okay, right. whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Look closely, yeah. <laughs> so when my mom moved into memory care, mm-hmm. I was kind of surprised how many family members, you know, for lack of a more polite way of putting it, acted like entitled jerks. Mm. It was like they were always asking and demanding things of the care staff Mm -hmm. and sometimes it was for their loved one but other times it was more like like activity related you know as you know in memory Mm -hmm. care all of the toiletries and everything are locked up in case you've got somebody that thinks the you know the shampoo looks like I don't know seven up or something I don't know how anybody could mistake shampoo (laughs) for something to drink but that's right. probably because I use the shampoo all the same shampoo yeah, all the time. Yeah. And, and it could be for the residents too that are if their brain changes and they don't recognize that. Yeah. Yeah, it was it was frustrating that yeah. everything was locked up and but mm-hmm. I understood the security reasons for mm-hmm. it. And so my request was, can I just get a key so that mm-hmm. I don't have to bug you guys? And mm-hmm. for whatever, whatever reason that one was denied. And that was fine. I'm like, fine. You know, if you guys want me to bug you when I need to open the thing to check to see if mom needs anything, well, that's how we'll do it. Yeah. But it became very clear to me that it was like, you guys are kind of being annoying. Mm. And then you leave with your loved one here and you've annoyed the staff. I'm like, that seems really risky. 
Not that I ever saw anything bad from the staff. They were all great. But I just thought, man, you are really, you're really testing people's tolerance Mm -hmm. and patience. Mm -hmm. And I, I just determined right then and there, you know, because just because someone's in memory care or assisted living does not mean your caregiving ends. It does change. You're not responsible 24 seven. You have more of an opportunity to go back to your previous relationship, Mm -hmm. which for me was best friend for my mom. She thought I was her best friend, you know, but I decided I was the captain of mom's care team Mm -hmm. and it was going to take all of us to make Mm -hmm. sure that she had good quality of life she got what she needed that she was you know safe and happy and all of those things mm-hmm. and so that's kind of what we're talking about today cuz i just uh, yeah i never understood why people acted like they were entitled to something from the staff i was like not right. really it's the person who lives here right yeah oh my god something tells good me that was kind of a rare thought <laughs> Yeah, well, it happens more more than you think it would. You're right. The topic of how do we not only as families uh, interact with senior living in productive ways and support our loved one, because you're right. I hear from families all the time that they feel a lot of family caregiver responsibilities, even though their loved one lives in a community. So while it's not what it was, and they're absolutely being supported in different ways. There's still a lot we manage as a family. I know when my grandma lived in a community, we still had had to provide different personal care items or uh, that companionship and oversight of doctor's appointments and finances and all of the mental load that we carry as a family member, right? Because we love and want to support our, our loved one. And so on the flip side of that, really talking about senior living and uh, how do we support families in senior living communities and understanding the family caregiver journey, I think, is the first step of engaging and supporting them. Because if we don't know what is happening in the family caregiver's life or what they're going through, we don't know how to support them. So really having an understanding and a lot of families too would say that they don't necessarily view senior living as where they go for support, education, resource. When you ask families and caregivers in the community, they don't mention senior living as that guide, let's say, right? So, uh, how I feel having been in senior living and seeing just the wonderful people that are a part of the industry is I really think they could be a perfect guide for families as they have the passion to care for older adults. They have the educational background. They're in a setting that really sets them up for being a hub of support, right? They're working with a lot of different types of people and businesses and support services that could really support families well, not just in the community, while that's important in what we're going to talk about today, but I also view it as what if senior living could actually provide all of the support and education and resource 10, 20 years prior to that move-in or crisis or event so that families are set up for success way prior, right? That they've built this relationship with the families and the community so that they feel that, oh my gosh, there's a place to go or someone I can call. And you and I know there are a lot of great caregiver support businesses in the community and companies and initiatives that are happening, but I almost feel like it's, you know, your listeners, okay, on one side, right, we've got caregiver support businesses, all that's happening, and then senior living is on the other side. And I really would love to see it merge together a little bit more, right? So how can we tap into what's happening on both sides to be this ecosystem of support for families uh, as a whole, because I think that there's a lot of a benefit, a lot of benefit for both. So uh, that I've got more to say, but I wanted to stop and see if you had any <laughs> well, questions my mom or was comments about that. A comment. Well, I think that's a fantastic mm-hmm. idea. So my brain is spinning with mm-hmm. thoughts and ideas. 
My mom was in an MBK senior living community. Ooh, and during mm-hmm. COVID, like their C-suite executives, marketing people, not the people in the communities, the other, I don't know where they were located. Yeah. They started doing um, Zoom talks, supports. Um, and I don't know if that waned. Yeah. But I've just started recently getting emails from my mom's community, the community mom was in. Yeah. I think they're at least doing one talk a month and it yeah. might be two. Yeah. Uh, time keeps flying. So I'm not. Oh my gosh, I'm, it does. Yeah. <laughs> so can't yeah. Believe and twice. you know, you're so right. There are actually, um, I've seen more so recently where there are senior li- living communities that are offering those webinars or where you can come into the community and hear a speaker and, and feel supported and have access to information. In fact, there's a guest I had on the podcast uh, from Kelsch Community, Benjamin Searmy, and he partnered with an occupational therapist, Lindsay DeLong, and they were teaming up to educate older adults and caregivers about how to maximize independence in your home. And that was one of the things we had talked about. Um, I know a lot of communities are sharing about how do you um, have a loving approach to dementia. One of the speakers was Laura Wayman. Um, Belmont Village is partnering with Joe and Bella of, for their adaptive clothing. And they had a fashion show. Priority Life Care is also doing the same where they are bringing in those other support systems to be an addition to what they're offering for families. So I definitely think that it's becoming uh, more common. And I think that senior living communities won't be able to, this is a bold statement, (laughs) won't be able to afford not to do those things moving forward. I think there's going to be uh, a high demand for more of the holistic approach. How are we supporting not only the older adults, but the family caregiver, as there's so much momentum in the family caregiver space about how are we supporting caregivers in the workplace? How are we supporting them and giving them resources to make empowered decisions financially or legally or or healthcare decisions. So I think that what will set apart good senior living communities from great ones is that extra component of how are they also supporting the family caregivers that are in their life. I recently toured um, an assisted living memory care community in Sacramento that they're on three acres of land. So I, mm-hmm. I was picturing buildings with like all of this property that could, the residents could roam on. There's just mm-hmm. a lot of property between the buildings and it kind of felt like a nice hotel, a little older. Yeah. So not, maybe not a five star, you know, $600 a night hotel, <laughs> <laughs> but it was, you know, and, and each building had its own dining room mm-hmm. and it didn't have a lot of residents. So it, I thought, this is really um, pretty nice. And they also had an adult day program. So what you're talking about, where where my brain is firing is, you know, we have this this stigma. I hope it's changing Mm -hmm. because I like to remind people that when my mom, my mom vehemently did not want to leave her home, Mm -hmm. even in advanced Alzheimer's, she she picked up on the clues that (laughs) she was leaving her home. It was not a fun day. Mm-hmm. But, you know, she always said, I don't want to be a burden to you, but I want to live in my home forever. And it's like, hello, those are mutually exclusive. So, yeah. you know, I had to make a decision that I knew was right, but it was very difficult because I knew mm-hmm. it wasn't what she wanted. And, you know, we don't really like to do things mom doesn't like, because even when we're 50. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this is true. Yeah. If they mm-hmm. start incorporating activities, talks, like you said, the fashion show where my mom was, the assisted living community, they had a great dining room. They had great yeah. food, great dining room. You know, they, I, they had the staircase. I'm, I could picture a whole, whole luncheon fashion mm-hmm. show. Where I'd have to <laughs> oh, drive back. I love it. Yeah. You could tell them about it. I know that is a great point is that the communities that naturally bring 
families in, whether it's a support group for a family member, whether it is, like you said, the adult day programs, that's an excellent, excellent uh, way to position your community for not only reaching people that aren't maybe quite ready yet for that move, but need to feel supported. Um, There's an amazing adult day guy, Chris Channa. I don't know. You probably have seen Chris on LinkedIn, but he has active age adult day programs. And that whole idea of bringing life to a community in that way. And also I think having, I'm trying to word this in a way, while we have to have rules and regulations when we offer living arrangements and we're caring for vulnerable people, there is also the idea of how are we flexible to accommodate family members? So are we offering, you know, visiting hours at any time? Are we including them in conversation, in care planning, and in communication for everything that's happening? Um, like you said, you you were leading your mom's team or ship, and you were a part of the care team. And I think that's when the most successful, you know, relationships and dynamics happen. The other side of with adult day um, is, are we offering respite care or short term care for family caregivers that might need a break in the community that helps them have a spot where they could bring their loved one for a night or two if they needed to, or a week if they're going on vacation. I think a lot of times, you know, I remember when my family was trying to work out a vacation and my grandma couldn't stay at the house by herself and how just stressful that is, right? You don't want to impede on your other family members and people are working and just the dynamics. But yet if we had a place that we could have easily um, provided support for grandma in that way. And then also understanding just how much of not only maybe the physical burden of caregiving, but just the mental health component to it. And even as a community recognizing what our families are going through emotionally, that there's some anticipatory grief happening. There's a lot of loss of control. You know, a lot of times our as family members, none of us sign up for saying, I'm going to care for my loved one for I don't know how many years, you know, uh, we do it and we do it lovingly, but it isn't necessarily something that we've maybe um uh, volunteered for, and maybe it is, maybe it is right. That care, care comes naturally for some of us. And when you were saying that some of the family members, when they're in the community, uh, just kind of expected to be, you know, waited on, or I don't know, have, have their needs met or entitled maybe is the word. Um, I think also, and my, my colleague, Jean Hartnett speaks to this beautifully is that a lot of times we're not only caring for the older adult, but we're also managing the f- complicated family dynamics and maybe possible possible trauma that has happened. And so when that happens, you know, it's that whole saying of hurt people hurt people. And so if you've got families and dynamics that have had complicated dynamics or experienced trauma or they're in pain or hurting for whatever reason that has nothing to do with senior living, it's still going to show up in those interactions. And so having an awareness of that, um, but then also from the family side, making sure that we're, that we're really mindful of these professionals that are caring for our loved ones and that they are doing the best that they can with the resources that they have. And and like you said, having that communication is key. And when we have the relationship with the people that are caring for our loved ones, we're more likely to not only have insight to the care that they're receiving or or what's happening uh, maybe behind the scenes, but they will also see us as people and as humans with a personal story and a history, and they'll feel more connected to us and we, they'll feel valued by us as a family. I know just the simple like, thank you for caring for my loved one, or my grandma had a few caregivers that just she loved so dearly and just making a point to as a family express our thanks and gratitude 
went so far because we were then much more informed and in, you know, involved because we had that relationship. And I think that that's important that they felt, they felt supported by us as a family. So uh, I could go on and on about that, but <laughs> well, I have, <clears throat> I have a story yeah. that's related to that. I would go visit once a week so I stayed for a couple of hours. Mm-hmm. I had many guests tell me I should go more often for less time. And when I finally started doing that is when my mom decided it was, it was she was done, mm-hmm. which was at the start of the pandemic. So I really mm-hmm. wish I had taken them up on that advice, but I still had my, my own business and my own things. And it was like, you know, it was at least 40 minutes of driving both, you know, round trip. And mm-hmm. it was just like, it just worked better one day a week. So I got to know, I ended up, I always ended up, going after a Monday meeting and I got there between two shifts between the morning and the afternoon shift. So I got to know a lot of the caregivers and the ones that were directly responsible for my mom. Obviously I was very invested in them and helping them. Uh, My mom wasn't always the easiest person. She was really easy until she wasn't. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them were like, this is weird. I'm like, no, this is totally my mom. It's okay. (laughs) Yeah. See, personal family insight, right? <laughs> yep. And so yeah. I, I developed relationships, like friendships with the caregivers that I saw every week. And so, mm-hmm. you know, we had, my mom broke her leg on March 8th, 2020. Uh, lockdown mm-hmm. went, happened on March 18th. And my mom passed away on March 31st. And then I didn't see any of them. I saw them a little bit when I got to go clean out her room in May. And then I went back in October Um, some of my listeners might remember that I like to make handmade greeting cards and I was just learning. And so I thought I'll make, um, Valentine's (laughs) Halloween cards, memory care residents and bring them a little treat because they all loved the sweets and they're not going to care if there's some little glue blobs or, you know, I'm still learning. So they're not going to care. They're just going to enjoy the visit and the treats and all that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and then I haven't seen any of those people since some of them left in that interim, but you know, it's just, it was weird. Like my mom Mm -hmm. passed away and we had lockdowns and I'm like, but I don't get to see so-and-so, or I'm wondering about, you know, this other person. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And it was, yeah. and it, I think that made a huge difference because they knew I cared. They knew mm-hmm. I supported them. I had a great relationship with the executive director of the entire community, yeah. mostly because I sympathized with them. Like, Lord, what a job. You know, you got right. the residents, the family, the staff. <laughs> like, mm, There's too many people to <laughs> report to. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now, fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement, and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Yeah, it's a lot. Well, and it really is, you know, you're able to provide insight as a family member to to the people in a community about what does your loved one love to do and how is it best, you know, to interact with them? Or if they, if they're not wanting to do something, what are maybe tactics that are successful or, you know, you're able to provide a glimpse and insight so that 
it makes the care that they provide go a little smoother and, and vice versa. You know, I remember learning from a caregiver, um, something that they did with my grandma that worked so much better than what I had been doing. And so I was able to learn from them as well. And, and keeping that line open so that it's that care team approach, right? Is that together we want the best for the person that that we love and that we care for and that we can do that. We can do that as a team. And I think they can share insights on how behavior or health or communication might be changing, or we can do that as family members. Like I know mom, you know, normally communicates this way and I'm noticing she's not. Is that is that something where we need to look at? Is there a bigger concern happening here? And so it just keeps everything more unified so that we can address things as they come up and as they need to. That makes sense. My Mm -hmm. relationship with the staff, the caregiving Mm -hmm. staff Mm -hmm. was so strong. So Mm -hmm. my I don't know if you know this. I know the listener, a lot of the listeners know this. So my mm-hmm. mom's name was Diane. She okay. befriended other Diane and they befriended other, other Diane. <laughs> oh, I think I remember as ta- well, there were like three Dianes that yep. you would take out or something. <laughs> yeah. well, that's exactly. So <laughs> yeah. it was my mom and other, other Diane. My, um, I don't remember it. Cause I, I took, I took my mom and one of the two Diane. I never took all three of them out. I wasn't quite okay. that brave, okay. but I would literally take, two of them to mm. pick two Dianes and take them someplace. Oh. <laughs> but wait, like one time I took mom and other Diane to the regional park and they mm. discussed this. Um, basically it was a trampled path. It wasn't, it wasn't an official path. Mm-hmm. It was super steep. It was one of those things where the young boys are going to slide down the hill on their buttons. Okay. And they talked about that path for 30 minutes. Now, if I had to listen to my mom yammer about that path for 30 minutes, I'd be pounding my head on the <laughs> oak tree. And that was one of the benefits, but there was one day and I don't remember, it was the other, other Diane, (laughs) Diane number three. Um, I, my, I guess my mom had a nail appointment or something and she said, well, can my friend come? And my first instinct was like, ugh, (laughs) then like, fine. And I, so I said, I'm taking mom and, and other, other Diane to the nail shop and they're like oh okay that's great and we're like halfway to the door before the staff's like hold on a second we better make sure the family's okay with it oh my gosh seriously oh and it was like they trusted me they knew i was gonna bring Mm -hmm. them both back they you know Mm -hmm. it's just i mean their instinct was have a nice time not okay well the procedure is we need permission from the other diane's family (laughs) it was so funny because i didn't even think about it and then they were kind of weird because they're like, why would she do that? Now I'm like, because they talk to each other. Yeah. I don't have to entertain them. I don't have to entertain my mom right. nearly as much as I do when there's two of them. Right. They talk to each other more than they talk to me. It was great. We oh, went, I know. It's so good when that comes together like that. I can't tell you how many people thought I had totally lost my mind because <laughs> I took mom and Diane number the other day. So it was, it was mm-hmm. Diane S and Diane R and my mom. Mm-hmm. So I, mm-hmm. Diane S and mom went to the regional parks. I took them to our city park because mm-hmm. they had one of those splash zones and it was mm-hmm. like hotter than hell. It was like 105 degrees, 108 degrees. Oh, that's a great idea. And they just sat, they're both moms and grandmas. Yeah. So I'm like, hello, yeah. I might as well let them watch kids. Right. That's, right. that's the one thing that worked really well with mm-hmm. my mom was taking her out where she could, mm-hmm. you know, watch kids and be outside in the sunshine and, and the splash zone was great. We had lunch, mm-hmm. you know, from subways or whatever. Mm-hmm. It was, you know, it got to the point where I was like, I hope these ladies are going to be ready to go soon because I'm melting <laughs> and I like it warm. So it was like, God, I hope these guys are ready. And then it was like, my mom looked around and she's like, I don't think I know where my room <laughs> is. I'm like, well, that would be because we're outside and not near your, not near your building. Right, right. And I forgot oh. about what Diane S said. She, she was, it was like, literally we were just hanging out and I thought I was going to melt into a puddle and then boom, they were both ready to go. It was like, okay. Oh. So well, and it great. gave them like, a friend with each other mm-hmm. too, you know, that like a buddy to, to be with and to do all of that with. Yeah. That was the best thing about memory care that I never 
anticipate it, especially the day we moved my mom in. And I was like, oh, my God, my mom is not as bad as some of these people. This is, oh, this is a mistake. Oh, no. And I was like, ah. <laughs> my mom had friends, and she did things in the community that she refused to do with me. Like, oh, I showed I up one day, yeah. and I look around, and I'm like, um, excuse me, but where is my mother? <laughs> and they're like, oh. oh, she's on the bus. I'm like, what do you mean she's on the bus? What bus? Uh what are we talking about it's here? So I know I, you know, I am such a proponent. If it, if it's what the person and family desires to be in a community where you can live out purpose and meet people and have the community and socialization. Granted, there are many different communities and types of facilities, right? So I'm speaking in broad terms because we know that there's exceptions to all of the rules. And some people really thrive at home and that's where they want to be. So it really is personal preference for sure. But if you are in a community, just to be open-minded to embracing the experience and know that your loved one is going to be doing the same thing. I remember there was a woman that moved into the community where I was a director and we were visiting and she would do all sorts of things with me and she would have a smile on her face and she was so happy. We did manicures and I got to have her go with me on an outing while her family would come to visit and they were also surprised that mom was doing that. But then mom would also tell the family, I'm not doing anything. I'm so sad and miss you. And, you know, it's like she wanted her family around, but it was just, you know, the stark interpretation <laughs> of what was happening. So know that, you know, how your loved one interacts in a community could be different and just to embrace it and get feedback from the um employees that work there because it could be different than maybe what your loved one is telling you. <laughs> and, so. and on the flip side too, there was, you know, like, so I would go every Monday on well, the third Monday. I'm like, this is the third Monday in a row. Mom's been wearing the same sweater. Mm -hmm. It's like a three quarter length with sleeve kind of mm -hmm. lightweight sweater, mm -hmm. but it was still like 85, 90 degrees. I'm like something's up. So I asked like basically like mom's personal caregiver. That's not quite how it worked, but she was basically the one in charge. And I said, is she giving you a hard time about changing clothes? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She, she doesn't want to take a shower. We had to rearrange the schedule and now her showers in the afternoon. I'm like, well, there's your first problem. Yeah. My mom. And I'm kind of the same way. You know, you get to a point in the day where it's mm -hmm. like, well, it's three o'clock. It doesn't matter that I've been painting the, you know, bathroom all, all mm -hmm. afternoon. I'm just going to wash my face and maybe put on non-splattered clothes or whatever you were doing. She got to a certain point of the day. It's like, I'm not, it's like, why, why I'm going to shower in the morning. Why bother showering mm, now? They moved right. her back to the morning and that helped the problem a lot. Yeah. Of course, we yep. know that, you know, people with Alzheimer's and other dementias have issues with showers. That's a whole other, that's a whole other. Yeah. Episode. Yeah. Well, and it but, is, it's trying different things and seeing what works. And then I know too. Uh, people living with dementia, we sometimes have to change what we do every couple days, you know. So uh, that is a hurdle to overcome, but you're right, it is. It's figuring out um, those different approaches for sure. And yeah. I think it was, you know, it was always helpful to me when you had the families that were there visiting and spending time with their loved one. And it, it relieved the staff for, you know, whatever, an hour, two hours, however long, mm -hmm. as long as you weren't demanding that they do something like, can you get us something to drink or, you yeah. know, I just like walked into the kitchen area. <laughs> it was like a little kitchenette kind of thing because mm -hmm. the memory care food came on t carts and trays from the dining room and I would just help myself. And one day I couldn't find the tea bags that I had brought for my mom and I'm like can you tell me where the tea bags are like oh oh we'll take care of them. I'm like no I'll take care of my own tea it's fine <laughs> like, yeah it's not your job to take care of me I am Aww. fully capable making my own mm -hmm. tea for mom and I and mm -hmm. they appreciated that and it I think taking mom out was another step and like oh okay there's one less thing to worry about right now. I don't have to worry about right. Diane I don't have to worry about Jennifer you know oh she took the extra Diane with her <laughs> yeah 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 Oh, so much. Yeah. Good things. Good things to be able well, to. Having been in Rotary and other um, philanthropic kind of organizations, mm. I think it's really beneficial. And a takeaway I want to give the listeners is, you know, if 
even if your loved one's at home or they're living on their own and you, maybe you've got caregivers coming and going, maybe they're not at the point where they need 24-hour care, mm-hmm. engage with your senior living communities yeah. because you'll learn a lot just mm-hmm. on how they are. Is it a place that you'd put your loved one? There was yeah. one literally a mile down the hill from my house. We went there to vote. I went there for a networking meeting. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that was that was my you know, with my interactions with them and the assisted living was great. Their memory care was like, seriously, two sets of locked doors. There's locked oh. doors, the outside, then the lobby, and then another set of locked doors. Mm-hmm. And it was very dark. Yeah. And the people there just, it just was not a place I wanted to put my mom. Right. And I right. knew from being there with weekly for the networking meeting, they had a lot mm-hmm. of turnover. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. on the surface, it looked really good. But, you know, when you kind of mm-hmm. peered a little extra, it was like, eh. yeah. Well, you that's know, so- such a good point that you're bringing up because if you're spending time in communities, whether it's for a meeting or volunteering or just a visiting, you do get a sense of what life is really like, which is going to inform your decision moving forward if you need to decide where your loved one is moving, right? Like you maybe wouldn't have known that unless you had spent a lot of time there. And I think that's so true. One one community I spend a lot of time in, in, in the area where I live to volunteer and to visit. Uh, I bring my kids. And because I've spent so much time there, I see how amazing the staff are, how they engage people, the relationships that they create, all that they do in their day. And I always recommend that community first to families in my area because I've had a chance to really spend time and see that this is a place I would put my loved one. And so I think that's important to If you're making that move at some point or just want to be, for me, it's like, I just want to be around older adults. And so for me, it's a, it's a happy place to go and spend time. And it's also great that I can then give that feedback to other people in my life about where should I move mom or dad um, or grandma and grandpa. Yeah. Yeah, Because that's a hard enough choice. Mm -hmm. You know, even if I don't think I've met too many loved ones, I did do an interview with the the executive director and a resident and she and her children looked around at many places. And when she walked into the community, my mom lived in, she's like, this is where God told me I needed to be. Mm -hmm. And so, but I still don't see too many people that, Mm -hmm. you know, are like, I'm kind of a huge advocate for why in God's name at 85, do you want to have to cook and clean and manage, you know, if you're lucky enough to manage a housekeeping, manage the landscape gardener person, there's mm. still so much stuff to do with a house. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, Lord. <laughs> you know, I want to like be able to just get up and decide what I want to do. Somebody else can yeah. cook or I can cook. Like, I really think we need, we need a very different view of mm-hmm. independent assisted and memory care living communities Mm -hmm. and by Mm -hmm. them incorporating the community and the community utilizing the services that they have that other than residency I think that would really help yeah I'm really really informative oh good I'm so glad (laughs) yes and it's fun to hear your perspective too and I know what we've maybe viewed as senior living that we experienced when we were younger with a grandparent is not the senior living of today. There is a lot of innovation that's happening. There's a lot of adoption of technology. There is uh, different styles and uh, apartment features and uh, wellness components where it really is If you are searching for something to bring meaning to your life and you've got a certain hobby or a certain way of how you like to live or interact, there's probably a senior living community out there that can meet that need. There's a lot of different options that there weren't in the past. And so I think that's been exciting also is that take a look and get out there and ask questions and just go visit. Even if you're not ready to make that move or your loved one is in a community and you're maybe not super happy or satisfied, I would say, A, first have the conversation and communicate, but then B, know that there are so many different types of living arrangements and senior living communities and settings and styles that 
you are more than likely going to be able to find something that really meets your needs in that way. That's been my experience. Mm -hmm. So to round this off, I'm a Gen Xer. I'm on the old end, old, old end (laughs) of Gen X. See if I can talk anymore. So I'm really big on the let's convert these dying malls to like assisted living (laughs) memory care residents for Gen Xers. Because you you got your food court, you got your arcade, you got your movie theater. All the things. You can walk inside and not, well, I'm in Minnesota, so not get cold. (laughs) But Sometimes our malls, because we, you know, we're not quite as cold as Minnesota generally. (laughs) You walk in and it's like, holy crap, I should have brought a jacket in July because mm-hmm. it's freezing in here. Mm-hmm. I know, I know. But I, I think you're right. I think it's changing a lot. And I think it's just, you know, this having these kind of conversation help, conversations mm-hmm. helps. Mm-hmm. And, you know, letting people know that, you know, like the community my mom is in, I'm not going to unsubscribe from their email, be- at least not yet. Yeah, because I'm interested in what they're doing, and I still have connections to that town. So you know, somebody right. might say, "Hey, you know, I need like I just got a LinkedIn direct message this morning. Somebody wants to talk to. I'm trying to remember if it's. I think it's a, the husband of a former sorority sister. Oh, <laughs> I think that's okay. who it is. Okay. And he said his dad is starting to have memory issues, and could he pick my brain? Sure. Okay. Apparently he's been busy working because I haven't gotten a response, yeah. at least not prior to our recording. I'll check yeah. when we're done. But mm-hmm. it's, you know, if he was, if he's close to where my mom was, I'm like, well, here's mm-hmm. some stuff these guys do and here's why I like them. Right. You know, like my mom's right. community, there was no restrictions. If I wanted to go at 1.17 a.m., I could walk right in. It They had it from the outside to the lobby was just a regular door and then it had the keypad door. Yeah. Um, so, you know, yeah. I never went oh at 17 a.m. <laughs> right. Yes. Well, and look at it too. I would encourage people to look at that, the senior living community in your area as an extension of your network or even friendships or community and how can you support or get involved or maybe ask the community, what are you needing right now? Or do you... Uh, want insight into a family member that's caring, you know, just opening up that dialogue, even if you don't have a loved one that lives there, I think it's, um, they're an extension of the people that we serve and in, in the area where we live. And so I think there's a lot of value in that. I totally agree. Mm-hmm. Well, this has been fantastic. Thank I'm you. so impressed that you, you did the whole first recording oh. without, without prep. <laughs> And now today we've done the one that we intended to. So yeah. I greatly appreciate your your gift of time to me and my my listeners. And I hope that they tune in to you because even though I do a show every week, you know, there's enough podcasts you guys can listen to one every day right. and get all kinds of great perspectives <laughs> and advice and stories. You don't oh, have to hear about you. Diane, other Diane, and other, other Diane. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so good. Well, thank you. And thank you for having me and and letting me share with your audience. It's been a pleasure. And I just, yeah, our conversations are always really fun. So thank you. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.